Okay, welcome to the first segment of the videos for Tuesday's class. Um, you will need to watch all segments that are available for Tuesday and make sure that you uh, have a little bit of memory about them because I'll be giving you some questions in uh, for an in-class quiz uh, that we'll, uh, we'll give at the beginning of class on Tuesday. The main point of doing this is to get you this information uh, since we only have two more days of class. So let's start with intelligence and see what is it? Well, um, that's a question that's not easy to define. The big point, semantics may be as important here as in any area of psychology. Some of the important words include aptitude, which is of course potential ability. Uh, this is similar to a predisposition in a disease. So. If you have an aptitude, you have a potential ability. Uh, ability itself is skill with no additional training. And psychologists actually give the term intelligence a definition of general intellectual ability, which is pretty much similar to we know it when we see it. Now, a little side point. Intelligence tests measure general mental ability. So they're similar to scholastic aptitude tests. And most people have similar scores on both types of tests. So uh, intelligence tests seem to be good indicators of school performance. Why? They tend to test the same thing. What are the mental abilities that make up intelligence? Well, of course, there's no agreement. Sternberg in 1981 showed that lay people and experts agreed on many components but disagreed on social competence, which experts did not see as part of intelligence. And, of course, the potentially, potential answer there might be that the experts didn't, weren't that socially competent. But most people today believe that social competence, or what some people call emotional quotient, or EQ, probably has some relevance to your intelligence. So let's take a look at uh, the history of the theories uh, in psychology about intelligence. Is it a single thing? Are there parts? And if so, how many? What about book learning versus practical knowledge? semantics versus application, common sense, and of course social IQ. Our first theory, early 1900s, came from Spearman, who argued that intelligence was a general attribute that sort of flowed like a spring throughout that person, a water spring. Uh, and in other words, it goes through everything that they do. If they're bright in one area, they're bright in all. Thurston, in 1938, disagreed. In fact, he's the first to come up with seven distinct different abilities, seeing each one is independent. In other words, you could be have one and not have another. Now, a little side note here on these um, theories that have a specific list of uh, abilities or um, issues that they think are part of intelligence. And that is that anytime somebody gives a specific list, it can immediately be criticized for leaving something out, having something in there that doesn't belong, not having enough, having too many. And of course, that's one of the criticisms that you'll hear about Thurston's theory and others that we'll talk about very soon. So the different abilities he thought were important were spatial ability, and that's your ability to uh, have an image in your mind of something and then move that image around and look at it from another perspective. Uh, we've talked about this before. Uh, the game Tetris is a, a good way of looking at that, or the research that was done by Metzler and Metzler, um, Shepard and Metzler, uh, that uh, shows how all of this works. But the ability to maneuver things in our minds and see them from different perspectives is something that humans are very good at, and it is spatial ability. Side note there, of course, as we've talked about before, research has shown that males tend to be slightly better at this than females, but the difference between the two genders seems to be decreasing with each passing year and actually is not something that's that evident anymore. Uh, it could be that uh, women didn't think they could do as well due to something like stereotype threat in the past. Perceptual speed, how quickly can you remember, how quickly can you understand things? Uh, numeric ability, that's basically math. Verbal meaning, which would be akin to the ACT, I guess, memory, uh, word fluency, in other words, uh, can you create language, and reasoning or logic was the last step in Thurston's theory. More theories. 
Cattell in 1963, instead of coming up with specifics, he came up with two clusters of mental abilities. First, crystallized intelligence. Uh, this was intelligence that he said was more semantic. The ability to use learned knowledge was the key here. This is heavily influenced by education. Examples of crystallized intelligence include reasoning, numeric skills, verbal skills. Now, we heard those things in the previous theory, but he puts them in as part of this crystallized intelligence that he said becomes more and more stable like a crystal as it's used more and more and as someone gets older. Now, on the other hand, he saw fluid intelligence as part of your intellectual ability. And this is the ability to solve new problems, uh, use logic in new situations, and identify patterns. Uh, this includes spatial ability, your ability to understand and manipulate visual imagery, your ability to see visual details, your rote memory, and many of these things tend to be more innate and not as influenced by education. Now, one of the things that this is connected to is street smarts. So it's stuff that you tend to be born with, but it's also flexible and adaptive like water in its fluid form, thus it's called fluid intelligence. Now when learning a new task, you start with fluid intelligence, but then once you've learned it, it becomes more crystallized. And notice down here on the bottom left, aging as you age, crystallized intelligence seems to increase, fluid intelligence seems to decrease. From there, and uh, the crystallized and fluid intelligence. Let's move on to Sternberg's triarchic theory, 1986. Uh, this, he, Sternberg came up with the idea that we had three kinds of intelligence. Analytical, the ability to learn how to do things, acquire knowledge, solve problems, carry out tasks effectively. These are, these are things that are tested in IQ testing. We'll be talking about that soon. Creative, new tasks, respond effectively to situation, and practical, this would be the other side, not book learning, but practical knowledge, includes making the most of yourself and your abilities. So instead of specifics here, we have three general categories. Now finally, we have, uh, as another major theory, Gardner's multiple intelligences. And Howard Gardner, who you've actually seen in one of Phil's videos already, also came up with this in 1983. And like Thurston, he saw distinctly different parts. And it's interesting, he adds some that we hadn't thought about before, but again, the uh, basic criticism you can come up with is too many, not enough, some things that are in there that shouldn't be, things that should be that aren't there. But what he came up with were verbal linguistic intelligence, seen that in pretty much all the theories, logical, mathematical, also in most of them, spatial, obviously, musical intelligence is a little bit different, so for those of you who are musicians out there, here's your chance to show how intelligent you are. Uh, intrapersonal intelligence, and this would be the uh, knowing yourself um, and understanding yourself. Kinesthetic, so we get some athletics in here too. And then interpersonal, which is dealing with other people. And naturalistic, which is interesting because it's your experience in the natural world, understanding nature, uh, and by extension, of course, uh, protecting the environment. So it's sort of a environmental idea. And finally, existential, the ability to pose and ponder questions of existence. So we see some interesting ideas here, and um, we see one that we really hadn't heard before. A few of them we hadn't heard before, but especially existential. And finally, Goleman's theory of emotional intelligence. Uh, he focused on how people perceive their own and others' emotions, and how they manage their own emotional behavior. He was prompted to develop this while trying to decipher the idea of the high IQ nerd. And he came up with the five areas that you see here. Self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, empathy, and social skill. Now these are also defined or described as knowing your own emotions, managing your own emotions, using emotions for self-motivation, recognizing the emotions of others, and managing relationships. Current research seems to show that the ability to correctly identify the emotions of others correlates to your SAT scores, but not all researchers see emotional IQ as a new form of intelligence. They believe it was reflected in most of the previous tests. So let's compare them. Um, Spearman, the simplest view, basically saying that intelligence was a form of mental energy. Thurston and Cattell, more detail of the structure itself. Sternberg and Garden, contemporary, and actually still theories that are supported today. Both emphasize more practical abilities than we had seen before. 
And finally, Goleman, a new dimension that hadn't really been mentioned as much, which was emotional intelligence. All right, so let's move on and take a look at the tests that test intelligence and see how they actually work. And of course, we'll start with the most famous one, the Stanford Binet test, which you probably know as the IQ test. Now, Binet was a Frenchman who created the first intelligence test to try and identify kids that might have problems in school. Now, it's kind of interesting that the IQ test was originally developed to find problems instead of coming up with a number that you can quote to people about how intelligent you are. Binet's test was brought to, to the United States and modified by Lewis Terman at Stanford University, and thus it becomes known as the Stanford Binet test. And the measure that it actually gives is called the intelligent quotient. Intelligence quotient. Uh, this is the mental age divided by the chronological age multiplied by 100 to get rid of the decimal. Newer versions have somewhat changed the emphasis of, of, of this, but the IQ score is still very important. Um, it's been updated over the years to reflect new views on intelligence, but the quotient, as we said, is still a number that people are very familiar with. Now, another IQ test is the Wechsler Intelligence Test, and this was designed to be more suitable for adults than the Stanford Binet. Uh, it was founded on Wechsler's definition of intelligence, which he saw as the global capacity of a person to act purposefully, rationally, and to deal effectively with their environment. So this one has more emphasis on life situations than the IQ test does. And it offers some different measurements than the Stanford Binet. And actually, speed and accuracy are part of the overall scoring for this particular test. So a little bit more for adults, but still it's a one-on-one -on -one test. In other words, given by a single uh, clinician to a single subject. That's it. Now, how can we test more people all at once? Let's try some group intelligence testing like the SAT, ACT. Advantages? They eliminate experimenter bias. It might be there for the individual testing. You get quick and objective scoring that gives easier to establish norms. And of course, you can test numerous people. Disadvantage all the problems of mass testing, including the person sitting next to you at the test who seems to be getting ill. It takes all your attention away from what it is that you're trying to do. Now, some other types of tests that we could talk about. Performance test and culturally fair test. A performance test generally means less words, more action. Uh, and it, one of the first was just a puzzle. Others are mazes. Now, one of these includes the Bailey scale of infant development, and it's... Uh, uh, offspring, the Bailey 2, uh, they actually look for movement. It would be difficult to ask babies too many questions, but both of these are actually focused on looking for neurological problems in children, ADD, uh, other situations like that. So this is a particular test that is much more active and has a lot less talking, of course. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about some general factors in testing including some terminology we need to know that help you to think a little bit about these tests and whether they're really worth paying attention to. The first is reliability. Uh, this is the dependability or consistency of scoring on tests. So what you really want to know is, will the same person score generally the same on the test every time they take it? And how would you know? Well, give the same subject the test at different times, do they achieve similar scores? If they do, it has reliability. Now, one of the problems there, of course, is something called the practice effect, which is the idea that you get used to the test or you know the questions already. So how can you deal with it? A term called split half reliability. And that's the idea that when you make the first test, you uh, purposely create an, a large number of questions, split them in half, and put half on one test and half on a second test, and give an A and a B version of the test to the same person and make sure that they score the same way. Uh, how do you deal with individual variants? Uh, so sometimes people do a little better than others and uh, they'll do better on one day than another or one time 
than another. So one of the ways you can deal with that is just by reporting the score you know, as part of a range within a range rather than a single score.